In this Climate Gen episode, I speak with Dr. René Van Westen about the recent research he published with colleagues looking at what it would take to cause the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the AMOC, to pass through its tipping point. Interpretations of this research have been published in the media around the world and debated across social media. Here, René gets a chance to clarify the potential for catastrophic impacts that would indiscriminately devastate Europe, as well as many other regions in proximity to the Atlantic and beyond. If you want to read about how governments have consistently lied to get us into this mess, then make sure you order my book Cop Out from the link in the notes. In the next episode, I will be speaking with Dana R. Fisher, discussing her new book, Saving Ourselves, and what it will take to create the anthro shift or social tipping point required to change course for the better. If the collapsing AMOC is the answer, I will pass on that. Thank you to all subscribers. Your support is always welcome. Extra episodes and episode previews will continue to be forthcoming. There is a huge influx of requests for interviews and climate and ecological stories out there to cover, and I'm totally overwhelmed. Thank you again for your interest, feedback and support. René, it's great to speak to you. Thank you very much for taking the time at short notice as well. Yeah, um, great. In your modelling experiment, to sort of trigger the tipping point, if you like, you, you feed in extra fresh water from glaciers and Greenland. Are the quantities that you're feeding in, so how do they compare to the actual of amounts of water loss estimated at the moment? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, um, and definitely it's not very realistic if you compare it to what's going on at the moment. So the present day melt rate is substantially smaller than the amounts we put in. So we are also very frank about this point. Uh, but the main point of our paper was not to mimic a real scenario. It was just to trigger this AMOC tipping point. Uh, and that is, the, is so in the end, when we find the AMOC tipping point, uh, we pour in 80 times, so eight zero times the melt rate uh, of the, the present day melt rate of Greenland. So that is very large, very absurd values. Okay. Um, and that's simply because the model is too stable. In a previous interview, I interviewed uh, Professor Jason Box, and he was talking about ice that's still on the raised bed of Greenland, but that's actually committed to be lost. Well, he was referring to a sort of zombie ice because it's going to come off. Did mm -hmm. your study, I mean, I'm trying to get, get an idea of how these kinds of quantities that are committed, how they sort of feed into this, because if you're saying it's 80 times, well, maybe all of these things added together start to give us something close to that. No, probably not. Um... I think we won't get to that particular point. Um, but the interesting point is, is that because these models have these climate model biases, if we are correct for them, we we probably expect that the tipping point will be much more closer. So then we're not talking about 80 times, so maybe then only 10 times or five times. We cannot say anything about that because we are not sure how all these biases influence each other because it's a very complex system. You can imagine that the atmosphere responds to that, sea, ice, land, ice. Um, so it is therefore a very urgent effort to the modeling community to reduce these biases and push the AMOC in the real observed regime uh, in these climate models. And where you're talking about the complexity, you cite the Gulf Stream and the, or the, also the Atlantic Ocean Circulation, is the other name, as the early warning signal. Can you just talk us through how that works and what the signal looks like if it was to tip? Yes, so that's a really good question. So I, I would like to start uh, with, with the mechanisms which govern, in, in the first place, AMOC weakening and AMOC tipping. Um, so in our climate model simulation, we add a small freshwater perturbation in the North Atlantic Ocean. And what it actually does, it slightly changes the densities in the ocean, so the density gradients, and this uh, results eventually in an AMOC weakening. But of course, the circulation still starts to turn over and it transports salinity from the equator to Greenland, to, uh, to the more northern latitudes. So this partly compensates this freshwater input. However, when you're very close to this tipping point, you're adding more fresh water, the AMOC decreases in strength, but then you are not transporting um, that many salt quantities again to the north, 
which then amplifies this initial weakening or this initial freshwater perturbation. So this perturbation grows, which then further weakens the AMOC. You're getting less salinity transport, which further amplifies that. So it goes on and on and on. Um, and this measure for this feedback loop, you can actually determine that at the most southern boundary of the Atlantic Ocean. So that is at 34 south. So that is between the uh, the tip of Africa and the South American continent. And what we actually measure there is how much fresh water is flowing into the ocean, in, into the Atlantic Ocean, or is exported out of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is called uh, the FOV value. Maybe you've seen the paper, I'm not sure, or the, well, it actually says something. But the, the main point of this quantity is when its value is negative, these kind of freshwater anomalies are amplified in the system. So that destabilizes the AMOC. And when it is getting more and more negative, it strongly de-amplifies the AMOC system. And what we are currently seeing in the reanalysis products we analyze is that this value is getting more negative, and that implies that we are moving towards the tipping point. Can we talk about the impacts then? Just how sure. drastic would it be for any specific regions that you can cite or for the planet? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, regions yeah, exactly. within the world or the planet as a whole? Yeah, so um, we were really surprised by the impacts and, and then in particular the rate of change. So previous studies already have shown what would happen if the AMO collapses and they already sketch a very clear uh, picture and we confirmed those results as well. But the rate of change, that is also something new. But first, just zoom out and what would happen? So the uh, the ocean circulation in the Atlantic Ocean effectively transports salinity and heat from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And when this stops, all this heat will pile up in the southern hemisphere uh, and the northern hemisphere doesn't receive this heat anymore. So you see this typical seesaw pattern. So the northern hemisphere cools while the southern hemisphere warms. Uh, and meanwhile, you also see some shifts in your precipitation pattern because it's also connected to the uh, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And the circulation also influences the sea level height in the Atlantic Ocean in specific. And you're also getting some sea level rise in the Atlantic Ocean up to one meter. And then you also ask about, okay, which region is most influenced uh, under such a collapse? And that is uh, the European continent. And the European continent is really influenced, for example, by the warm Gulf Stream. And without its heat, European climate cools down by about 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, and some regions even cool down by almost 20 degrees Celsius. So that is quite absurd. And yeah, to find this kind of very sharp and uh, stark temperature contrasts. And obviously with all the pressures around the world as it is this i mean europe regards itself as fairly stable we would, we would be talking about some major disruption um, exactly and to be clear i mean there are quite a lot of eminent scientists responding to the media around all of this saying you know uh, this is a risk but it's not a forecast it's no and how would you characterize the risk in response to your own work? Um, I think the scientists that they provide indeed a correct image of our study is that uh, indeed we don't have this forecast. We only can say that there is a potential future in which that can happen. It's now also confirmed by our study. And uh, I agree with other scientists as well. This is only one study. So I hope that other modeling groups uh, will also uh, do the same experiment and hopefully they can verify our results. That would be a very nice contribution. Um, but our study cannot say anything about any risks. Like this is going to happen, for example, by 2030, 2040. We cannot say anything about that. Um, what we can say, however, is that we are moving towards this tipping point, uh, and this enhances the risk of undergoing such a transition. It is getting more unlikely, but how more likely we cannot say that. And of course, that is the one million dollar question. If we could answer that, like by this year, it would collapse. Of course, that uh, that would help, and we need to explore this more. Okay, and my sort of rational response to listening to you and 
saying this research is that we need to sort of organize multilaterally and take appropriate action. And that would be done through political channels where structural action is possible. And what sort of response have you had from the policy sphere so far? And so far, I didn't saw any policy makers or response to that, or I didn't saw anything on Twitter. So maybe you've seen some of uh, some findings from policy makers. No, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of the point, really. I, I just think it's amazing that you're highlighting these risks. You're not saying it's going to happen. You're saying that we're edging towards this. All current fossil fuel policies are making it worse we need to change um and it's a frightening prospect for all the reasons that you said mm -hmm. and it sounds like as well a, a too big a shock for mm. for many people to survive and, and it could be indiscriminate basically you're saying europe but it, i mean the knock-on effects will be absolutely catastrophic as you're looking at the cause and effect out of all your research here how confident do you feel that we can actually avert these kinds of colossal deadly impacts um whether it's in our lifetimes or even the next generation um yeah so i i think it will be uh, um so also during the previous cop meetings uh which have been uh, have been done in the past uh, there was also this very important uh, report coming up and they, they mentioned like uh, the closing window. So there is still an opportunity to transit to a green and sustainable world, which stays far below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But the window is closing very, very rapidly and we need to take action now. Um, and then if you look at how current policies are made and that is still supporting a lot of, of uh, our fossil fuel emissions, um, it, it is not in line with, for example, 1.5 degrees Celsius nor 2 degrees Celsius uh, warming with respect to pre-industrial uh, pre period. So um, I think there is still time, but time is running out uh, very soon. So we need to take actions now. And such actions will definitely prevent further destabilizing the Earth climate system. So therefore, I think we need to really take climate change way more serious than it's already uh, been mentioned by a lot of scientists. But the scientists, have, I mean, you guys have kind of done your work. <laughs> we, know what the, we know what the problem is. And we're going we, are, spinning... we already know it since the 90s, 1990s, yeah. or before that. So it's, yeah, exactly. all, it's all clear. And so, so we've had decades and decades of absolute failure. And now we get a COP28 and we're going to COP29, which is an even bigger joke. And I mean, these are like death policies they're coming up with because they're just saying, yeah, we're, by the way, we're expanding our gas production and uh, oil production. And therefore, that makes what you're saying is... a uh, is a you know a big certainty if we carry on doing what we're doing an inevitability mm -hmm. based on those those you know those points and they're not going to change course we kind of know that don't we i hope that I, I i am wrong in in this issue and that we can avert such a such a potential scenario of a future amoc collapse but continuing on this road, it will become more likely. And I hope with also with these results, it provides much more evidence, hey, this is a potential future scenario. If you want to avert it, you need to take action now. And before uh, before uh, our publication, people could still argue, okay, uh, maybe this is still a dream-like scenario. There was still discussion among the community whether this was really possible in such a, a climate model simulation. So this is a very important piece to the puzzle. And therefore, it is very good that it is now out there and that uh, we can uh, inform policymakers much more carefully and also with more information what would happen if we are continuing down this road. Okay. And just to end on, you just said about informing policymakers, we just talked about that, and they're not doing anything, but you are doing a good job actually in informing the public because this has gone right across the media and i know some scientists are like wait everybody calm down it's not the end of the world just yet but really the public do need to know and the public do need to respond and if this impact kicks in it's not going to be one you can easily bounce back from no exactly. so 
is that part of your mission here with the with the great communications that you've done? Yeah, I'm I'm really uh, pledging for a lot of outreach with the general public uh, because then they are also familiar with this point uh, that there is also a potential future, which 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 this can happen, and I think it's very important to inform the public well. Uh, also, of course, not to scare them. I think that's also very important because maybe you've seen the headlines that uh, in 2025, the AMOC will collapse and this will happen. That's clearly not the case. And that's also not uh, how we uh, communicated our results with, with the media. But of course, people would like to uh, get some more readers to, uh, to their news stories. Uh, and, and therefore, I'm really glad that you asked me for this interview that we can discuss a little bit more on this issue. Uh, well, it's been really, really interesting. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the work. And yeah, but I think you've done the right thing. I think people need to understand that we need serious fossil fuel non-proliferation treaties to get this just out, of, you know, to change direction. So thank you exactly. very much. Mm -hmm.